this is uh, a very special evening, and I hope uh, the first of many annual meetings where there will be uh, a, the kind of educational compo component that takes the young Greenway and puts it into a national, uh, international context. Because there are, uh, there are certainly aspirations uh, among the public and the board and the Greenway Leadership Council and the staff that this very, very good park will continue to get better every year. And it's wonderful to have uh, extraordinary uh, examples in this country to benchmark against. And I'd like to introduce you to Patrick Kalina, who will be uh, sharing his e really extensive expertise in horticultural design and taking a brand new park and setting it off like a rocket ship. And I'm referring to the High Line in New York City, where Pat served as Vice President of Horticulture and Park Operations for the Friends of the High Line. And prior to that, he was Vice President of Horticulture Operations and Science Research at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. So that speaks uh, for itself, I think. And it's wonderful to have him here. He's going to be speaking for a few minutes, and then we'll open it up to observations and discussions, <coughs> questions with him. And then we'll stop that portion of the meeting and go into our business meeting. Those of you who need to you know, go home to friends, family, dinner, whatever, please, uh, we'd love to have you stay. But if you feel you need to leave, we certainly understand. But let me turn it over to Pat, and we will ask the light genie, oh, light genie, <laughs> to turn the lights off or down, and off we go. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Great to be here. Um, I've known uh, Linda for a while, and, um, and a lot of the folks here in the Greenway who are really doing something that I think is, is really important. It's, it's sort of participating in public horticulture in a way that uh, is seen as, as potentially transformative for, for a city. And, and that's really what we're focused on here. So if we can do lights. And <coughs> OK. <laughs> well, you kind of you get a sense of what that is? All right, so this is the, this is the coast of New England um, still. And, and this is really the way that settlers would have seen it, you know, coming to, the, to this country. And uh, a wild place, a natural place, lots of outdoor space. And, and in a very sh re short period of time, it, it became this in, in cities. And cities no longer or, or didn't have areas of public space where people could go out and, and participate in outdoor activities. And what's interesting is that in the mid 19th century, the number two public attraction for outdoors in the country after Niagara Falls was Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And what that speaks to is a, a public place that was potentially accessible to all. And it really predates the park movement. The park movement, and, and actually the Greenwood is still worth going to. It has magnificent, huge trees uh, that date back for the century. So the, really the classic park making period in, uh, in New York began with the design of Central Park. And here you have you know, the constant tension of parks in the city where you have geometry of nature really right on the top. I mean, uh, at the bottom, and then uh, geometry of man up top that's really sort of static. But when you drop your eyes, you're, you're in a, a naturalistic space in a very short period of time. So these are scenes just off of Central Park South, surrounded by all the big hotels. And they were created by Olmsted and Vox, of course, who then went on to create Prospect Park in Brooklyn, <coughs> uh, which they considered to be their masterpiece. They felt was uh, less compromised than, than the Central Park plan. And all of that rolling topography and those, those advancing trees are, are contrivance. They're created. And, and what they provide in that sense, in these natural spaces in the park, are places for kids to have adventure, to take risks, and to participate in the outdoors in ways that, that uh, we can't fully realize at this point. You know, we don't know what that kid in the tree, uh, where he thinks he is. He's certainly up off the ground. Or in that, in that boy's memory on the right, how big that's going to seem like a river in his memory that he crossed. Uh, now, here in the 21st century, we are embarking on a, in another realm of park making in New York City, and people are now thinking about new ways uh, to create public space in a city that's already essentially built out. So where do you turn in those 
moments, you really turn to the abandoned spaces, which is <coughs> the post-industrial landscape. And really, that's what you're seeing. So here's Pier 1 in Brooklyn Bridge Park. This is actually built on a pier. All of the topography sort of created, trees coming. And up that slope, you can sit on a stone staircase and look at Lower Manhattan. And this is the first of, of several piers that are <coughs> underway. A terrific project. On the Queens waterfront, Gantry uh, State Park, uh, the gantries that used to suspend the, uh, the train cars coming from Long Island onto barges to go to the city are still in place. And uh, they, are, they form this frame for views of the east side. And there's a, a, a kind of a naturalistic landscape there. There's fishing piers, places to sit. And what's nice about these things is it hasn't robbed the space of its industrial connection. So people have a sense of what the history was there. Uh, and this movement is, is happening everywhere. And sometimes it's a simple thing. Like in, in this case, uh, the, the bridge of Poughkeepsie. Uh, which was, tr was an old train trestle that was turned into a public space, and now it's just a long bridge across the Hudson that gets people views of the river and connects two small towns, and, uh, and gets a, a tremendous amount of visitation. Uh, this is the Lurie Garden, part of Millennium Park in Chicago. Uh, this front section was done by P. Odoff, and he, you know, this is the roof of a parking garage, so it's, it's not just a park, but it's, it's playing in ar an architectural function as well. So we're in a position now where people are starting to think about landscapes in a new way. And really, I think that's what leads you to the Greenway, is, is a sense of this is an un, these are non-traditional spaces. You wouldn't have thought years ago that the front page of the New York Times would be waxing rhapsodic about the beauty of landfills. Uh, but in this case, it is a sense that there is nature uh, going on in spaces you don't anticipate. And from my perspective, I grew up in New England. I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. My house is on the upper left corner there. And, uh, that, you know, it was on the edge of an Olmsted Brothers Park, which is the biggest urban park in the region. And we had these large open meadows, but you know, in the town we also had the Mark Twain House, which every school kid is, has to go to, a pain of death. And, uh, and, and on the right-hand side, Royal Typewriter. So we, we would go by these massive like, castle-like structures, which is you know, kind of an, a mark of the, the manufacturing past, and they're less preserved than, than our historic homes or even our farmsteads. And so now we're in a position where people are starting to not only look at the industrial past, but to use those spaces repurposed in a way that benefits the public. And uh, a lot of design that you're seeing is taking the dynamic forces of regional plants and employing them in, in naturalistic ways, like uh, this meadow at Storm King in upstate New York. I mean, it, it helps to have a calder to put that all together, <laughs> it's in your budget. But, um, but these are really sweeping uh, landscapes that have been created that it also require less maintenance. As Nancy said, I used to run horticulture and operations at the Botanic <coughs> Garden, and that, that garden was founded 100 years ago on a twin premise. It had a, a local flora garden and a children's garden. And if you did that today, you'd still sort of be thinking ahead, right? Uh, and th this is the motif in the gate on the entrance to the garden, and you see the lady slippers there with some other wildflowers, and you walk into the garden, and you can see lady slippers drawn. And in New York City, you can see forest dynamics underway in, in this natural place. And over 200,000 school kids every year will walk through this space and get a sense of what woods are like, even though it's in the city. And the, the irony is that it is functioning like a woodland. Things are seeding around, and there is succession underway. And this whole space that the garden is on was an ash dump uh, at the beginning of the, the 20th century. So these are spaces that have been converted. That was a brown, essentially a, a brown field uh, that was converted into a beautiful place. Uh, this is how I first saw the High Line as a trespasser uh, more, than, more than 10 years ago. And uh, I highly recommend responsible trespassing. Uh, because what, what it was was a chance, and there's a couple of guys there who are very active in the horticulture world. Uh, and what it does is it gets the word out that there is something there special to be, to be shared and to be preserved. Because in uh, 1999, the structure was condemned in the previous mayoral uh, administration. Uh, and the argument was that it was both an eyesore and that it was an impediment to development. It was physically <coughs> blocking uh, the industrial west side from emerging as a city. So we'll see how that works. Uh, so here, here is what was, what was called <coughs> section one. Uh, it was the first part of the park to open. It's Gansevoort Street to 20th on the left side there. That opened in June of 2009. Uh, the middle section is uh, 20th Street to 30th Street. That opened in June of 2011. And that fish hook there at the top 
is still the wild component of the High Line. It reaches out to the Hudson River. It touches down in front of Javits Prevention Center. And those two big rail yard parcels are the last, you know, the last huge development opportunity in Manhattan. And there are <coughs> really big plans for that space. So I'll take you through briefly through the history. In the, in the early part of the 20th century, the High Line uh, didn't exist yet because trains ran at grade on 10th Avenue. So here we are, 10th Avenue. You see freight trains occupying the ground with the earliest automobiles, horse and buggy, <coughs> pedestrians. So many people were killed uh, by trains that it, it became a tabloid sensation and 10th Avenue became known as Death Avenue. Uh, so there was a specific movement underway to say, what can we do to prevent this from happening? The move was to, to build the High Line. In the meantime, they hired these guys that were known as the West Side Cowboys, and they were hired to ride on horseback in front of the trains, shooting people out of the way. <coughs> See, he's about to be out of the job. The High Line is, is in, in place and behind him. Uh, so in, in the early 1930s, you see the emergence of this, this uh, freight structure, <coughs> essentially designed to take uh, mostly agricultural products from upstate New York down the West Side. And the idea was to directly service buildings along the way. So that bridge is 30 feet off the ground. There is uh, 10th Avenue on the right. If, if some of you know New York City, you know the London Terrace apartment buildings on 23rd Street. That's actually on the right-hand side there. And this is the view north. And so in between 10th and 11th Avenue, we could directly service buildings on the left and on the right. And uh, did so uh, in the north part of the line from 1932 uh, to 1980. In 1980, the train stopped running and the, uh, the, what happens in, in, in natural succession starts to take place. That a meadow emerges, uh, things start to break down in the ballast, form a rudimentary soil, and this landscape takes place in the air that really nobody quite knew about unless they had a building that looked down on the space. So for most folks who were on this part of the west side, a lot of machine shops and garages and scrap metal yards, it was a, it was a gritty, uh, often tough uh, neighborhood and very much industrial two avenues removed from uh, the closest subway and not necessarily right for ho ho uh, housing development at that point. So the short story of, of the evolution of the High Line is that uh, two guys, uh, Robert Hammond and Joshua David, who were just guys that lived in, in the West Side, uh, read the, about the, the, the fact that it had been condemned and went to a community board meeting, just a meeting like this, to sit down and see who they could meet to join a group to prevent this from happening. At that point, still not really knowing the full extent of how, uh, how lush this landscape on top of it was. There was no group. They were introduced to each other. They formed Friends of the High Line. And they, that became the, the sort of the birth of what eventually is the conservancy that, uh, that with the city of New York helped to build this park. So you, had, uh, you have now in the, uh, you know, in, about in less than 10 years, this, that was in, in, in uh, 1999, you went from an idea at a community board meeting to open, uh, opening the first section. This is a New York City public park. It's, uh, the, the rail company donated the structure to the city. And uh, the, the process of building it was a team of really talented and, and dedicated people from throughout city government and with the Conservancy Group and then a great group of, of designers who I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, so you have a, a Conservancy that is the first conservancy in New York to open a New York City park. So most of the conservancies in the city have opened uh, as a response to some, some challenge that they had in, in, in management. So here is uh, the, the way they got it going. They got, uh, uh, this is a photo by Joel Sternfeld, and uh, Joel's a, a great photographer, and he took a series of meadow shots to get people a sense of what they hadn't seen, that there were a series of serendipitous spaces that were really compelling, and this could help tell the story of, of why it was important to save the structure. And there is a, a lot of planting design up there. It is not this kind of planting design, which is great. I mean, it is, it is um, there, there are no annuals. Uh, there, are, there aren't a lot of bedding plants, or there aren't any bedding plants. It really is meant to be a, a singular series of spaces, and, and I'll describe that as we go. Um, the design team was uh, James Corner Field Operations was the lead in landscape art with their landscape architects. Uh, Dillis Cafidio, uh, Renfro Architects, and a, a Dutch planting designer and nurseryman named Pete Odolf, whose specialty actually is working with herbaceous perennials. And he is a big believer in sequence and seasonality, <coughs> and the seasons are sort of split into seasons, and you have this unfolding 
a series of colors over, and textures over time. Even as the foliage is sort of senescing, it's still playing a color role in the landscape. This is his landscape, this is his landscape at home in Holland. So he spends a lot of time growing these plants that he ends up working with in a variety of designs. So again, to give you a sense of what we're looking at, this is the High Line, a very slender park on the west side, uh, the Hudson River there with the piers, which is also part of a park now. And um, we'll just take a quick sort of impressionistic view of it. This is the southern end. The actual the, the train itself, the tracks itself used to run down toward uh, the Holland Tunnel, which is the terminal warehouses just north of the Holland Tunnel. And that part was cut off in the, in the 1960s. So you end up with this sort of section view, of the, the low end of the line. The Whitney Museum is going to build a large museum uh, on that location to go with its uptown location. And so you'll go up through these stairs, through the structure itself, with a really great design intervention, uh, with these long approaches to the, the stairs to, to kind of slow down your pace. And you pop out at the top, you're 30 feet in the air, you're at the, the, you know, the top of that image. Still in uh, the meatpacking district, that's the, that <coughs> roof uh, complex that you see is the meatpackers co-op. And uh, the rest of the neighborhood has become very much a fashionable neighborhood for, uh, there's hotels and, and restaurants, clubs, and, and actually a fair amount of representation of the fashion industry. And so what's interesting about the design is it is very much a modern design with modern materials, but it hasn't robbed the line of its essential self. You know, It's still a train uh, viaduct. It still has the original side rails. The train rails were replaced in their original locations where they're back. But the idea of what, that the designers came up with was to merge the living landscape and the physical landscape so you had a sense of the encroaching nature and, and to really blur it. And I think you see this now. This image was this spring, and this is only the third spring for these plants, and they already feel like they're kind of engulfing a series of spaces as you switch back and forth, moving from south to north. And you get a sense here from this shot that you know, you're really on a bridge. It's not a, not a super wide space here. And it, it's important to note, too, that like the Greenway, this is a promenade, which is really more of a Victorian concept. You're going to walk from one place to the other. You may have a seat, read a newspaper, or talk with a friend. But most people are moving from home to school, drinks to dinner, uh, back and forth all day long, seven days a week, uh, day and night, to see. And as they do it, they're doing it through a sequence of plants that are constantly evolving. And and you're immersed in it. So even though there's a path going through that, you don't quite make that out in images like that. And you have a, you have a sense, too, that kids can roam around, as you'll see as well. It's, it's sort of a clean, safe place to be. It is lit at night. It is very uniquely lit. It's demurely lit. So you're dealing with lots of shadows, and you're picking up lights from the city, uh, while the rail lights still allow you to sort of read the plant material in the beds. And the plants themselves, uh, despite all of the um, attention for everything else are playing a role. They're also playing a role in habitat, which I think surprises a lot of people. But there are you know, all manners of pollinators up there and wildlife. Uh, and to a lot of folks surprises. So I think we will see, you know, when kid, we have kids coming up watching birds run around on the, on the grasses up there, this is actually planted plants on the home. And it's, and it's still functioning like a meadow above the west side as for food source for these birds and shelter as well. And to just give you an idea of the disconnect that most people have about nature in a city, um, I was walking online once and I was wearing a badge and some guy waved me over and looked very confused and he said, I've got to ask you a question, I'm really confused. And this is a space where you look down on, on one of the bridges. And he said, um, you can hear that? So he said, yeah, I, I know, I can't find what you're, you, where's the sensor? Because every time I walk by, <laughs> it's like a second sensor. And I said, what do you mean sensor? He goes, well, you know, it's, I must be tripping some beam or something. So they, they said, every time I go by, it's quick. And he was with his kids, and I don't know. And I said, well, it's not, it's not a sensor, it's just crickets. <laughs> and he was a really long, uncomfortable pause, and he said, well, where do you get your crickets? <laughs> so the people think of you, we were importing insects to the uh, experience. You know, this is the way that it works. From the moment those plants are set down, they start to interact with the environment. And just to show you about uh, achievability for any place, you know, on a bridge, on the ground, or whatever, if, you, if the plan is right and, and the execution is right, things can happen very quickly. 
So I'm going to take you through a year uh, on the line. This image is in, in one section. So this is the, the what we call the Chelsea grasslands. The, uh, the circles uh, are the, the locations of some of the perennials, and the grasses get woven through it. This is the fall of uh, uh, 2008. And everything there in four inch pots. Okay? That's the following spring, just after things start to green up. That's the following spring. That's the following late spring. That's the following early summer. That's the following midsummer. <coughs> midsummer. All from those four inch pots. And that's one year later. These grasses are starting to turn to fall. So that's, that's a lot of momentum in a fairly short period of time. And it sort of speaks to the potential of herbaceous perennials, which is not a plant that gets used quite, quite often enough in, in public design because you know, perennials means maintenance. And for most people, that's a daunting concept, right? So even as everything sort of goes tawny and starts to move over toward, to, you know, toward the senescent period, it, there are still people moving through the landscape. Because it is a way to move through the city with a unique perspective. And the grasses sort of animate that place. So another section, that bridge with the crickets. Here, here you have um, everything comes up, and that soil went down. This was built to hold full freight trains. You can put machines up there and, and actual soil. Um, <coughs> so that is spring, first spring, first summer. First uh, entrance into fall. So uh, kids, uh, there were talks about children's feature. You have a children's garden. Well, the high line is a children's feature, sometimes uh, on purpose and sometimes not. So like the gravel, uh, the gravel Olympics here, let's get like a gravel shower. Uh, is an un unintended uh, use of that material, but it's interesting. And you know, the machines, obviously, compelling. Uh, but you know, there, there are lots of programs and events. So in this case, you know, this poor little guy planting bulbs on literally the coldest day of last year. Uh, but, uh, it is, it is an, an both an active and passive opportunity for children. At the end of the day, I like watched these kids um, when we, after we first opened, staring out, out at traffic from 30 feet in the air, looking uptown, and they were there for a while. So it is just a different perspective with views of boat traffic on the river, by the way people move through the city. And then during some program events, like this children's musical instrument event, they're in what we call 10th Avenue Square, which uh, the, in that case, the surface was cut away a steel armature was dropped in and those benches were built on them. And then the wall, uh, holes were cut in the steel wall and glass was put in. And as you create this amphitheater so you can sort of be in the structure itself and still watch the city go by. And now, you know, on, on quiet days, you see that couple on the right-hand side there, it becomes a very intimate space and then nobody on the street has any clue of what's going on over there. <laughs> uh, but again, the plants are meant to be, to, to be wild and with lots of sequences and textures and color. Um, this is the, uh, we call the, the, the sun deck, uh, people in chaise lounges uh, facing that sunset. If it's a good day, that's your sunset every day, and lots of boats moving past. Uh, you move through some of the buildings, in this case, Chelsea Market. Uh, and then to go back to that idea of, you know, this, this thing is, a, is an impediment to development. Well, Frank Gehry had already designed that headquarters for IAC, but uh, with the High Line came the Jean Bell Tower in the back, Little Shigeru Bond, Townhouse Wedge in between, and the apartment building to the right, and many others as you move up 10th Avenue. So the, 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 since the opening of the Highland, you feel a complete vitality on 10th Avenue that makes it feel like 8th or 7th, uh, where that wasn't the case a few years ago. So just to give you a sense, there's, there's lots of different plants, lots of different sequences, everything from bulbs to vines to trees, shrubs, things that bloom in the spring, things that look good in the fall, uh, things that look good in multiple seasons. So here at 14th Street, it looks like that in, in midsummer, and then all of those sumacs start to turn orange, and the late asters and goldenrods come in, and, and so you get this surprise kick at the end of the season. Um, also, believe big believer in people cultivating the landscape and being in it at a time when visitors are there. So the, the, the employees of the High Line are all <coughs> part of the same team. They're very interested in working there. They answer questions for people. They help with wayfinding, history, uh, and uh, plant information in this case. Uh, there's a liquid sidewalk there that people can walk and walk through barefoot. And, and then things that come later in the season, you get snow. And then you can come up and sort of see this architecture in, without going through the sort of slush and hopping over snow banks in the street and really be, participate in a New York winter. Uh, and we've had a couple of real ones in the last two years. 
And you know they do on the line what they do on the ground. So this little <laughs> snowman compilation. <laughs> uh, and, and so you know, talk about this because ultimately the, the big goal is that you have people, or right? you don't want to create a place that's just plants and then nobody goes there, or just architecture and nobody goes there. And so, in addition to all of the visitors that now you know, more than four million visitors that have come to the island, you have these these quirky characters who just have emerged and, and play <coughs> small roles and then move on to the next thing. So we have the guy in the Star Wars helmet playing <laughs> themes on the accordion over and over again. This guy would set up his little mini museum with a glued on mustache and a stuffed coyote. I'm not sure where he came from. And then, for a lot of New Yorkers, you know, if they don't have a landscape, sometimes even their fire escape is the thing. Well, here's a woman who lived next to the Highland for many years, in this quiet neighborhood in the wild landscape. And that's her laundry on the, on the, um, on the fire escape there. And uh, so when, when the stairs, the temporary stairs of 20th Street were built, those lights went up, and they didn't have hoods on them yet, and they shone right into her apartment. And that was not fun for her, obviously, so we had to get the steel company to come back and to, to put hoods on that. And it took a while for that to happen, so her response to that was to create a, 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 a different uh, response. So I came up the stairs one of the first nights, and I hear this music, and so I'm standing on that stair I just showed you, and I saw this scene, people standing in the path. The fence there was the construction line between sections one and two, and there on that patio with the lit up lanterns is a woman with a microphone singing to the crowd. And so that was the birth of what's called the Renegade Cabaret. <laughs> so can you hear this? So, so that's Elizabeth, her friend, and then and, uh, Patty is the, the one who has the apartment. And so that was their, their reaction. So what, what did that <coughs> yield? Oops, why did we do that? What that created was, I mean, they got their own New Yorker cartoon, which was interesting, and thousands of Facebook friends, and it became this huge, actually sometimes scary uh, dynamic where hundreds of people were stretched out on the bridge trying to listen to this one thing. Uh, and, but it was an interesting response because Patty had been a very shy uh, person who lived in that neighborhood kind of quietly for a lot of years, and she came out of her shell in a big way and suddenly became like an MC to people who were living a regular. So it's just one example of the connections that were built over time. And when she got she got kicked off of her fire scheme by her landlady who didn't like the fact that she was in the New York Times and you know, all the other things, uh, they went inside the window, kind of Amsterdam Bordello style, and performed that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's Mary. Uh, so um, to give you a sense of life on the line, I mean, in the spring there's a big uh, cutback. Uh, get volunteers to participate in that. Sometimes corporate volunteers, one-timers, sometimes continuing volunteers. And it gets cut back to that level, and then the bulbs come up, and then everything starts all over. Soil, like here, has, is uh, shallow. So in this case, about only 18 inches there. And um, everything that went up had to go up by crane or boom. Uh, and very time-consuming process. Oops. And so you give you a sense of this is from a, a client's uh, apartment roof looking down at the line. This is how slender that thing looks from a distance. And in the second section, there is a, a, a bunch of different features. This is now just open. There's a two block long thing called the flyover. Uh, it's a steel structure that you're able to move through the canopies of trees, or will eventually be the canopies of trees, with little occasional places to stay in between the old freight buildings, the old refrigerator warehouses. There is a, a section at 26th Street where there used to be a billboard, and so now that with that big bench, the people are the billboard street. <laughs> and, um, and an interesting thing as well, in, in the first uh, in the first section, the buffet was used, which is a tropical hardwood, and it's going to be logically problematic. And uh, so in, in this case, and a lot of researchers done, we ended up with a reclaimed teak uh, from the post-consumer product and buildings that had been taken down. And, 
was repurposed into a series of benches that we'll, you'll see in a second. Mm -hmm. So here is a very early shot of, of spring, uh, the bulb season in the second section, and these plants are only a few months old, and then they gave way to this. So here's um, late spring, and then just a few weeks later, summer starts. Trees and shrubs in the second section as well. There's a lawn, uh, another uh, sort of bleacher uh, for seating there as well. The lawn rises up and the edge of that frame becomes a bench. And then again, short period of time, here's early spring without soil yet on the left. You can see the rails in and then just about a couple of months later, plants in and blooming. And that's one example of the second section of construction, that long radial bench structure as it moves up to the rail yard. So here's the end of section two. You go up a ramp and you look down what's called a cutout. The structure's been cut away so you can see what the bridge itself is made of. It's a really hefty, durable thing. And get a sense of its sort of history and its character. And then if that dividing line becomes back to that wild section that we talked about. So you have these great lines that move out to the Hudson River. There are lots of things like cherries and crab apples that have seeded themselves into the tracks. Lots of great surprises, chives. Um, and then, you know, this constant dynamic landscape that you just put something down and the, the grasses and wildflowers go up. So if you're there in the spring and it looks like that, you might not be impressed, but if you go back now, it looks like that. And the fall meadows from there to there become pretty dramatic and, and pretty surprising. So just, we'll wrap up with the sense that this is part of a, a bigger thing. Right? In, in the west in Germany, the Ruhr Valley, you have the Erzbahn or the ore train that used to connect the industrial sites now repurposed into a bike and walking path and connecting all of these sites which have been turned into parks uh, that have been planted, they're still wild, uh, they're sometimes they're whimsical, they're lit at night, and they're incredibly dynamic. Um, this this uh, is the coal plant in Essen, which is a World Heritage Site. That used to be flat ground. It was filled in with water and in the wintertime becomes the world's longest ice rink. And there are performances at, the, at, the, at this end of it. It's a really amazing place. Um, design competitions to build out the parts of the, the train that had been lost. Uh, Tempelhof <laughs> Airport in Berlin closed as an airport. The public says, please open it as a park, and just takes it over as this wild space with wild meadows in between the runways. And then I love this. This is uh, Südland, uh, the, the, um, the train yards in the south of Berlin. So three stops from Potsdamer Platz. You can go here, and inside are these painted walls, and all of those birches just came up wild. They just put pathways in between it. Really magical landscape. So in, our, in this country we have opportunities. You know, Bethlehem Steel closes and there was this great ruin and, um, and now we have a casino in it, which is I think less than inspiring. And uh, <laughs> there are other opportunities, right? So here in downtown Philly, Center City, if you've been to the flower show, you've been to that white rectangle there, the, ter the terminal. Right above it, Road Vine Street, there is a train track sort of tracing its way through. And right downtown, you have a Philadelphia Highland, which is literally two blocks from the flower show. And that the pathway which connects into the city. So there was a time when this kind of thinking started. Just in one example from a project in Rochester, there's this, this church that burned down that was turned into a great park. And there was this bridge that was turned into a walking path. Both of those took place in 1980. And neither one of them caught on because there were no people. And so you, you need to do it with, with people. So now this, this uh, bridge is being repurposed and rethought of so that the views of the falls, which look like that in the winter, really reemerge this way. And they're incredibly dramatic. The second largest falls in New York. And uh, then hopefully becomes a vibrant part of downtown on both sides of that river. And, they, by, and the way they get it started is by having events like this where they got thousands of people to come down into an environmental festival and really focus on the potential of the historic neighborhood. So you have this, and I know, you know this is a, a fairly uh, controversial highway, right? And, uh, but at the end of the day, what you end up with is this, and this is unquestionably better. You know, an, an unfettered uh, transition from, from neighborhood to neighborhood as opposed to a series of, of walled off spaces. And if you talk to people in cities who still have those highways, uh, they're facing substantial challenges, like in Toronto, for example, with the Gardner Expressway, where they have all of this uh, activity on the waterfront and really no way to see it or get to it or to get people inspired on making that connection. Uh, Seattle is another example. So 
again, I, uh, congratulations for all your hard work, and thank you for your invitation. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll just answer. Just a question about the structure. Was it sound, and is it sound for 100 years? Or yeah, it, or is, it was incredibly sound. I mean, the, everything came off. You know, the, it was um, the ballast, the old ties came off. The, the rails were cataloged and set aside and they, with little GPS markers on them. And then they went to work on the structure itself. The biggest uh, expense, actually, was the, uh, the, the stabilization of the bridge from an environmental perspective. It had been um, covered in lead paint. So that had to be abated over the course of a mile. That what I just showed you, the sections one and two is a, a mile long. And uh, so that work was done. And then patches were made to the concrete deck and, dr and a drainage system was put in. So once you put one drop of water on something, you become responsible for where it goes. And the real challenge of the line was that it crossed a series of private property after private property after private properties. So you had to make sure that nothing would fall off or leak into the building. So it is, it is incredibly sound. It had a million rivets in it, literally. And uh, in many cases, laps of steel that, that cut out allows you to see where one piece of steel on another on another. And uh, really, really durable structure. Um, how much did the, did the first phase cost, and how much did the second phase cost, and how far are you along toward um, the funds necessary for phase three? The, the first two sections combined were $150 million, a substantial amount of money. Uh, the the uh, 100 million dollars in city capital money, and the idea was that there was a a revenue projection based on what they thought new tax new tax revenue would come from uh, the repurposing of the west side, and they came up with a number I think it was 262 million dollars was the original estimate. Well, that that number has been revised upward by more than 100 percent since, and it really has been more dynamic uh, an opportunity than than previously thought. Uh, the third section is still in the hands of the railroad. So that is still, I mean, I mean, they're making strides, but they're negotiating with the city for the transfer. And then its ultimate design will be based on how they can harmonize with the, the, the developers who have the title to the rail yards. Because until that, I mean, we're talking about the original plan for the rail yards development was the square foot equivalent of two downtown Seattles. I mean, gigantic. Schools, hotels, uh, corporate stuff, and, and places to live. So all of that will dictate what the budget for the third section was. But the hope is that there will be some connecting path uh, that will come through the existing natural wild landscape so that people can get a sense of what was there before they get to the, the place that was sort of redone. So that's still in negotiations now. Uh, what percentage of the plants are native? Plants of that bioregion, or New York. It's uh, you know there, it's not all native. It's a combination of, of native plants, exotic plants, and, and garden varieties. Um, I think what what's meant to happen there is that those plants are evocative of the of the wild landscape or analogous. So there may be asters up there wild, but it may not be aster blancifolius, or it wouldn't wasn't aster blancifolius, which is the aster that's up one of the asters that's up there now. So it is meant to be. You know, to pursue a, a, an aesthetic within a, a sequence calendar. And the plants are chosen more for their kind of wild characteristic and their durability than necessarily their na nativity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our so-called native plants are Midwestern prairie plants. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a relative term. So uh, what you have up there are plants that are derived from austere landscapes so that they can handle that level of exposure, which is a lot of sun and a lot of wind from the, from the river. But there, there is a substantial a number of, of, of North American and Eastern native species. Mm -hmm. Oh. Patrick, can you just talk a little bit about sort of the governance of how the, the Highland works and how, I guess, uh, where your revenues are derived from? Sure. The, uh, the, the Friends of the Highline Conservancy uh, runs the park through a license agreement with the Parks Department on behalf of New York City and New York City Parks. And it's a very close relationship, uh, a consulting <coughs> relationship, but the, the actual uh, responsibility for managing the park 
is, is friends of the High Line. It's actually also the, the, the uh, responsibility for funding it. So all of the operating dollars come from Friends of the High Line with the exception of Park Security, which is the Parks Enforcement Patrol that provides uh, the police um, presence. Uh, and they're also, the city is also responsible for bridge inspections. But their, their largest, you know, obviously a very substantial number was in the capital phase. And uh, in the support phase for delivering uh, an, a design that was true to the de design intent, you know, a lot of the really compelling things weren't value engineered out. And when they're in danger of being lost, then Friends of the High Line would try to find a donor to make that go. So it is, it's a very uh, successful and sophisticated um, relationship with uh, city planning, city parks, the EDC, the, the city's developer, which builds a lot of it pro its projects, uh, with the design team, Friends of the High Line, donors, and a substantial component of the community, which, which uh, the Friends of the High Line spent years and years talking to and meeting after meeting to get a sense of what, what people were really hoping to, to, to get to. Oh, the revenue. Uh, so the so revenue is, is generated through uh, fundraising, a very active fundraising program. Uh, it allows for all of the, pro the, all or mostly all of the Highlines programs uh, to be run free of charge, like kids' programs are essentially drop-in events. Uh, there's movies and dance and theater and all kinds of things, an uh, active arts program. Uh, all of that comes through donations. There is a, a working on a plan towards a, con a concession plan, which will kind of in some of the neighboring buildings connected to the line that's still sort of being worked out. Right now you'll see some transitional food vendors, but really the ultimate goal is that there will be some earned income from, from concessions as well. Yeah. What percentage of, of it is green space and what percent is hardscape? Um, it is, I, you know, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say it's probably, you know, two-thirds, uh, two-thirds to... 70% um, green space. Because when you're, when you're going on a path, you're in an eight foot path, and there's about 20 feet um, of, of beds on both sides. So the, the, one of the interesting things about the, the paths are that, again, yeah, they're scaled pretty intimately as well. They're, they're about the size of a, an urban sidewalk. And um, you know, in, when the Highline first opened, we were getting Saturdays with 20 to 25,000 people a day. There's more people than visit the Statue of Liberty in a day. And, uh, and if people going off every stair, 500 people every 15 minutes, just kind of ticking their way through. So it is a, um, it is a hope that the scale of the, of the pathways work themselves out with a, with a chance to, to provide some robust plantings. But in some places, it can be a little tight if the crowds are up. Yep. What's it like underneath the high? So if um, the, in, the, when I showed you the bottom of the Highland or the southern end with the stairs, that little corner parcel, that's the only plot of land under the line that the city controls. That's um, essentially going to be the plaza for a small Highlands operation building and uh, then the large Whitney Museum uh, structure. The rest of it are a series of private businesses. Uh, there are many, and, and they kind of follow the trend of whatever's in the neighborhood. So part of the standard hotel is both over and under the line. Um, but there might be a little coffee shop. There, there are definitely uh, photo studios, fashion designers, uh, lots of art galleries, machine shops, taxi garages, sort of a, a hodgepodge of what the West Side was and is. And um, it, it's actually interesting to walk under it. And what you'll see, too, is people will program at the empty lot. So uh, David Byrne, a um, musician, lives on 10th Avenue right uh, near the line. And he did an art installation under the bridge and this giant inflatable globe that he kind of wedged under it. And it was just a, a reason for people to get in and, and see it from a different perspective. And uh, Friends of the High Line took over the lot temporarily at the 30th Street end, at the north end, and put in a beer garden and, and some food trucks and roller skating and, and attractions for kids seasonally during the summer as well, just to sort of animate it from the street. But it, it is, um, it can, it's still pretty industrial under there in parts. Thank you. Maybe one more question, and then we, sure. then we should. Okay. I was just curious about your watering system because you talked about not having much soil right. there. So, how do you how do you do that? There is um, there's a, there's drip irrigation on the woody plants in the first section, and everything else is just quick connects that you um, could hook a hose to. Okay. 
and wood water. Uh, the second section has uh, two systems. It has the same one for woody plants and then a network of, of drip lines for the perennials to establish them. But the hope is that you know, you're putting in plants that don't require constant watering. You know, if you're conscious of the water that's used there, if you're watering in the city, you're using potable water, right? So you're, you really want to be responsible about how much of it you're using. So it's a very, uh, the hope is very limited amount. And there's, there's a capillary um, roof product underneath it that, um, that preserves water when it can, and the beds are sort of geared to, to collect it from the, from the pathways as well. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.